a lot of news coming out this week, so hopefully I can make up for the lack of podcasts last week while I was down in New Orleans uh, with some more frequent podcasts this week. You know, we're going to get a two-day Fed meeting that begins tomorrow. I think on Thursday, Trump is supposedly going to announce his pick uh, to replace Janet Yellen as the new Fed chairman. Also, we're going to get the unveiling on Wednesday of the highly anticipated Republican tax reform, a.k.a. tax cuts, uh, masquerading as reform. We also get the jobs data on Friday, so uh, a lot of economic data coming out, and I will try to opine on as much of it as I can. You know, today, the one significant piece of data that came out, personal income and spending, pretty much in line with estimates. Everybody, of course, looks at the spending, which was up 1%, which was a big jump, uh, the biggest jump in years. But what's more significant to me is not what went up, but what went down, and that is the savings rate, which is down to 3.1%. This is the lowest savings rate since December of 2007. Now, something that happened in December of 2007 was the beginning of what we refer to as the Great Recession. So the last time consumers dipped this much into their savings to spend, it ushered in the Great Recession. So this is not a good indicator. And if you remember, too, the government didn't acknowledge that recession until almost a year later. So if we're beginning a recession now, I mean, clearly we got the GDP numbers last week, another 3% quarter Uh, of GDP growth. It's back-to-back threes now, assuming this is not revised downward. So clearly, based on those measures, we weren't in a recession, but maybe we're starting one now, uh, as is evidenced by the uh, lack of savings. It means that consumers are fueling their spending, not because they're earning more, but because they are saving less, or they are depleting uh, their existing savings and taking on additional debt in order to spend more, which is not a good sign for future uh, consumption, unless these Americans are simply spending more money because they anticipate big raises, which may be the case, but they may be anticipating something that isn't going to happen. And of course, if Americans don't get uh, the big raises or maybe the big tax cuts that they're anticipating, then they may have to retrench in order to replenish the shallow pool of savings that they have. And, you know, by the way, as low as the savings rate is, 3.1%, it's actually much lower than that. Nobody really talks about this, but several years ago, and I forget exactly how many, but it was sometime during uh, the 2000 housing bubble when the savings rate was already falling. And in order to make it less embarrassing, right, how little we save, they actually changed the methodology for calculating the savings rate. So what the government did is they decided to include a lot of things as savings that prior to that change were not considered to be savings. And so by making that change, there was a big jump in the savings rate. But of course, there wasn't an actual change in behavior. We just started measuring savings in a different way so as to have a bigger number. So if we were still measuring it the way we were back then, the savings rate could actually be negative right now because before they made that switch, we actually had the savings rate dip into negative territory, which obviously was very embarrassing. So rather than trying to uh, do something to encourage more savings or maybe stop encouraging more debt, instead of dealing with the problem, they papered it over by coming up with a new way of measuring savings. And all of a sudden, the savings rate shot up, and so it wasn't as big a problem. But this is how government operates. They always change the methodology for computing something so that things that are supposed to be big are bigger, like GDP, and things that are supposed to be small are smaller, like inflation. So they always lie. They always you know, monkey around with the numbers to create uh, the impression that things are better than they actually are. And so when it came to savings, they wanted to create an impression that we had more savings than we actually did. You know, that's another one of the reasons why 
the idea that they're going to try to eliminate or limit the deductions for 401k contributions. Obviously, for a society that doesn't save enough, uh, removing uh, the tax incentives to put money in your retirement account would simply add to the problem. But of course, what they don't really like to talk about is the fact that they all want us to spend money, right? They want us to goose the economy, Keynesian style, by spending money. Well, you can't spend and save the same money. So to the extent that you're saving, that means that you're not spending. So in reality, people don't want a higher savings rate. And in fact, if they want to have tax cuts, then one way to finance the tax cuts is to take it out of savings and try to discourage people from saving money so that the government can spend it on tax cuts instead. And this is also part of the the problem that no one wants to acknowledge with the tax cuts. And that is that, you know, we're broke and the government is already spending more than it collects in taxes, which means, if anything, we should be having tax hikes, right? That's what the president should be telling the American taxpayer, that the taxes are too low and that we need higher taxes, unless, of course, we're going to shrink government. If the president is sincere in his belief that Americans are overtaxed, then they're overgoverned. What the president needs to do is be honest with taxpayers and say, look, I understand your burden of high taxes, and I'd like to lower it. That means we have to shrink government. We have to make government less expensive to let you off the hook, right? If you don't want to support big government, if you want lower taxes, We need to get rid of big government. So what the president should be talking about is all the agencies and departments that he is going to eliminate. He should be talking about the entitlements that he's going to cut, like Medicare and Social Security. He should be talking about reducing spending on the military. But of course, he wants to spend more on all these things. So uh, all this talk about tax cuts, this is all a fraud because government is getting more expensive and the taxpayers are going to be stuck with paying the bill one way or another. And, you know, they keep on launching these trial balloons. I was reading over the weekend now, you know, they're backpedaling now about the idea that they're going to eliminate the deduction for state and local taxes. Now they're saying, okay, we may eliminate it, but we're not going to eliminate it for property taxes. So everybody can still deduct their property taxes because everybody pays property taxes, right? Whether you're in a red state or a blue state, you know, whether you have a state income tax or not, And in fact, some of the states that don't have state income taxes have higher property taxes to make up for it. And and so they're still going to allow uh, the property tax deduction. At least that's the latest trial balloon that I heard. But we still have a lot of pressure from uh, Republicans in high tax states to, you know, allow the deduction to to stay the way it is for all uh, taxes, including income taxes. But, you know, the housing uh, industry is still pushing back because they want uh, people to be able to deduct their property taxes because that reduces the uh, the cost of buying property and therefore makes the property that they're trying to sell makes it easier to sell or they can sell it at a higher price because it comes with a, a tax deduction. But of course, they also want to preserve the home mortgage deduction. And in fact, I was reading now how the housing lobby is trying to get something in there because if they double the standard deduction, that means far fewer people will itemize their deductions, which means they won't need the tax break associated with home ownership. And that is a problem for the housing industry that is really selling tax shelters uh, at the same time they're selling actual shelters. And they're trying to lobby to get Congress to put back in another homeowner's credit that would just, even if you don't itemize, you could still get some kind of tax benefit for being a homeowner, which is exactly what tax reform, if we were really reforming the tax code, should not want to do. The tax code should not be about shaping behavior. The tax code should not be incentivizing uh, consumers to buy houses when renting might be a better option. And in fact, I even read too that some of the housing lobby, they're still trying to say, well, let's, let's have a tax credit for renters as well as home buyers, which would defeat the whole purpose of supposedly putting one in there for buyers. Because if you can get the credit, whether you rent or buy, then, what, then it doesn't matter. And it's not going to create the added incentive to buy, which is what the home industry wants, because these tax benefits and the home mortgage deductibility doesn't actually help home buyers. It helps home sellers. It helps the people who are selling houses because they get to sell them for a higher price because embedded in the price of the house 
are all the tax savings that you get by buying one, right? It's part of the value of the house. It's like the location. Uh, is it in a good neighborhood? You know, you get, you know, the, the, the landscaping or, you know, how nice are the materials. You have all these various components that are going to, you know, create the value of the house. Well, a big component is the tax savings. That's part of the home's asset to you. You buy this house and you get to save money in your taxes. So when you buy the house, you pay for all those tax breaks up front. They come embedded in the price. And, and so it really benefits the people who are selling the homes, not the people who are buying them. That is the irony of the whole thing. It doesn't make home ownership more affordable. It just makes homes more expensive. So you get rid of all these deductions, home prices are going to fall. But of course, that's what the home industry doesn't want because they want to sell higher priced homes, not lower priced homes. But of course, the problem for government and for the banks is if banks have financed homes based on the embedded value of a tax deduction, then you take that tax deduction away and then the real estate loses value. Well, that's the collateral for a lot of loans. And that creates an incentive for people not to make their payments, walk away from their mortgage, jingle mail, right? We saw all this uh, the last time the housing bubble burst. And so obviously people are worried about that. But, you know, they have to keep coming up with angles on how to, quote unquote, pay for these tax cuts without completely blowing up the deficit to an even bigger number than it's going to blow itself up to anyway. In fact, another trial balloon that came out over the weekend, obviously the market's uh, not liking it, is that the corporate tax cuts, where you know the plan is going to lower the corporate tax rate down to 20% from 35%. Now they're saying that this would be phased in over a number of years, and so that we wouldn't actually get to a 20% corporate tax rate until the year 2022. Now, why would they be doing this? Well, obviously, to the extent that they can delay the phase in of the lower rate, then the effect on the deficit, at least during the initial years, is not as great because they don't have to calculate the reduction in the tax revenue uh, right away. They can, you know, they can think about that in the outer years. Now, of course, a lot of people are saying, oh, well, this is still okay because at least it's a permanent tax cut and American businesses will still know that they can look forward to these lower tax rates. And really what these lower tax rates are designed to do is to make the U.S. a more competitive place to do business and to get uh, companies to think about that when they're deciding you know, where to open up a new factory or whether or not, in fact, to relocate their company offshore uh, because now they can compare a relatively lower U.S. tax rate with tax rates in other countries that are already lower than ours. But my feeling would be if they delay the implication of these tax cuts until 2022, they ain't happening. I mean, because a lot of stuff is going to happen in the economy between now and 2022, including another presidential election in 2020. And I'm already on record as saying that I think that Trump is going to be a one-termer, that I think he's like the Jimmy Carter uh, of today, and that he's just going to be a placeholder between two uh, Republican administrations. Uh, Carter was between Nixon and and Ford and between Reagan. And I believe that Trump is going to be between uh, Obama and then whoever replaces him. But just the way when Ronald Reagan ran for president, he also ran in 1976 in the primary against sitting President Gerald Ford and lost. But in that loss, I think he turned the Republican Party to the right. Because prior to that, I mean, prior to Reagan, they were all Rockefeller Republicans, right? Uh, Richard Nixon uh, was, was a liberal. He was a Keynesian. He wasn't anything like Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan turned the Republican Party, right? Because that was the same uh, a party. They had nominated uh, Barry Goldwater uh, years earlier, and so that was the beginning of it. But Reagan really solidified that, that Goldwater wing and really took over the party. And when Uh, Jimmy Carter, who was the outsider, the peanut farmer from Atlanta, when everything blew up on his watch and things didn't get better, uh, the economy or the electorate was ready to go hard to the right and embrace a Ronald Reagan. And so it was the disaster that happened under Carter. But Carter didn't cause these problems. I mean, he inherited these problems from from Nixon. 
uh, who inha- also inherited them too from Lyndon Johnson and Kennedy and all the great society and war on poverty and you know the guns and butter and all the deficits that were produced in the 60s blew up on the 70s and that led to the counter move in the 80s with Reagan. Well, I think the same thing is going to happen this time around except you had all these problems that were built up under Obama. They're going to blow up uh, under Trump. But Bernie Sanders was the opposite of Ronald Reagan. Bernie Sanders, I believe, moved the Democratic Party to the left. And in fact, maybe the electorate is now prepared to elect a socialist. Now, it may not be Bernie Sanders running again, the way Ronald Reagan ran again, but it may be somebody like Bernie Sanders who ends up running for president in 2020 and beating Trump. Or if Trump doesn't run for re-election, you know, whoever the Republicans nominate in his stead. But if we get a Bernie Sanders type as president in 2020, what are the odds that the 2022 corporate tax cuts are ever going to see the light of day? I mean, I would bet anything that if we get a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress, that they're going to jack those corporate tax rates through the roof. I mean, all these people talking about permanent tax relief, what are these guys smoking? There is no permanent tax relief, especially when you don't have any relief from increased government spending. You know how much bigger the national debt's going to be by 2022? I mean, they're going to have to raise taxes on somebody, and obviously corporations are going to be an easy target, especially if they end up getting vilified, especially if the fact that corporate tax cuts happened at all is going to be part of the reason that the left is going to say the economy is so screwed up. Remember, they're going to say that Trump inherited a great economy from Obama and screwed it all up with tax cuts for the rich and for corporations and by undoing all the great things that supposedly Obama did. And now we're going to have to, you know, fix the the problem again, right? You know, we drove the car back into the ditch and now we're going to need the Democrats to, to get us out. So these tax cuts are going to go away. So I don't think the markets are going to believe tax cuts that are not going to uh, be enacted until after the next election. Now, I'm sure there will be some reduction, even if we have this glide path to 20% by 2022, that there will be some immediate tax relief. But it is not going to be as big as everybody is expecting. Also, another thing that I read about over the weekend, and I talked about this on my podcast before, is the fourth tax bracket. But now I'm reading that it's not just going to maintain uh, the 39.6% top bracket, but that it might actually increase the top bracket to uh, 43, 44%. So this could actually be a tax hike on the upper income people, which of course, since you're raising the marginal rate of tax, would be a sedative to the economy. It wouldn't be a stimulus. It would actually be punishing uh, people for working harder or investing more and would actually be uh, you know, anti-growth. Uh, but of course, the other anti-growth aspects of the program is the fact that you're not shrinking government. And so as long as government is getting bigger, it has to be paid for. And if it's not going to be paid for through taxes, it's going to be paid for some other way that's going to end up being more expensive and is going to stifle growth. And of course, people are not looking at what happens to interest rates if we get tax cuts or even if the economy grows more or if inflation picks up, what happens to labor costs. And everybody is so excited about how much money corporations are going to save by paying lower taxes, even though the effective tax rates right now on most companies is about 20% anyway. But what's sure that's going to happen is that corporations are going to have to pay higher interest on the mountain of debt that they have, and they're probably going to have to pay higher wages uh, to their employees. So the net effect of increased wages and higher interest costs will likely be a bigger sedative than the stimulus from having a lower tax rate. So people are not looking at this thing in totality. But by the time we get the details of this tax cut, which I think is on Wednesday, people are likely to be disappointed in the fact that it's not going to deliver as much of a tax cut as quickly as people thought. And the one thing that's going to be for sure is that it will deliver larger deficits, right? Now, they're going to try to claim that, well, you know, these deficits are some kind of a down payment on smaller deficits or surplus. But they've been saying that ever since they had deficits. It's been one lie after another. So the growth is pie in the sky, right? That's, you know, buying a pig in a poke. 
But what we know for sure is if you reduce your revenue and you continue to increase your expenditures, your deficits are going to get bigger. Another problem that Trump is going to have with the tax cut, and I identified this problem early on, has to do with the way Trump initially portrayed the tax cuts as being for the middle class, for the working guy, the average Joe, and how he personally didn't benefit at all uh, from the tax cuts. Trust me, believe me, I don't benefit from this. And I mentioned how ridiculous all this was because he was so obvious that the president benefited. He had benefits from the elimination of the alternative minimum tax, from the abolishment of the estate tax, and from the lowering of the top marginal tax, and in particular, from the lowering on the tax on uh, LLC, on pass-through income, which is probably where almost all of the president's income comes from. He's not a W-2 employee. Uh, he gets uh, you know, pass-through income from his uh, business uh, holdings. And obviously, to the extent that it qualified for the 25% rate, it would be a windfall uh, for the president. But obviously, just the elimination of the estate tax, which is something I'm in favor of, but that is a multi-billion dollar windfall for the president, and he ought to embrace that and own it and describe why the estate tax is so bad and why it's so good for the economy to get rid of it. He can also make the moral argument why it's you know bad uh, to, to redistribute wealth at death anyway and just to talk about uh, all, all those implications, but just explain the economic benefit of not destroying family-owned businesses and forcing liquidation to pay uh, for an estate tax, which barely you know, raises any money anyway. It does so much economic damage, and the government gets such a small amount of money to inflict such a large amount of damage, all because it's good politics. It plays into the politics of envy, and the president really should have taken the moral high ground and defending the elimination of a, a, such a horrible tax, but instead he just denied that he benefited from it. But I said at the time this was going to come back to bite him, and that's in, exactly what's going to happen with this push to have a fourth bracket that may in fact be higher than the current top rate, which is the rate that we got under President Obama. And that's because if the president claimed that this tax cut was not about the rich, then how can he defend uh, the the tax cut for the rich, or how can he say, look, we're gonna we're not gonna have tax cuts if we can't cut taxes for the rich, when he already said the rich aren't gonna benefit. So he's placed himself in a box that it's hard to negotiate out of, and in fact, he may have to uh, allow the higher tax cuts on the rich based on the fact that he's already staked out that ground. He's already said the tax cuts are not about benefiting the rich, so now he has an opportunity, or maybe not the opportunity, but now he's stuck. Uh, with producing a bill that, in fact, does not benefit the rich because it does not lower the marginal rate of tax. Now, they're still going to benefit from the elimination of the estate tax and potentially the abolition of the alternative minimum tax. But the other thing that he is going to have to do, he is going to have to put much uh, sharper teeth in the rules to prevent the rich from benefiting from the 25% tax on pass-throughs because they will be the overwhelming uh, principal beneficiary because small businesses, I mentioned this on my last podcast, there are many small businesses that are going to be in the 12% tax bracket. So they're not going to benefit from a 25% tax on pass-throughs when they're paying 12. There will be plenty of people that will be in the 25% bracket. And so they're not going to benefit from a 25% tax on pass-throughs. The only people that will benefit are people who would be in the 35% bracket or the 39% bracket or some higher bracket. So it's only the higher income uh, recipients of pass-through income that benefit from the 25% rate. It's not the, the small guy, but uh, the professional baseball player, the professional basketball player, uh, the A-list Hollywood actor, the real estate mogul, hedge fund titans, uh, partners in law firms, accounting firms, white collar guys that make the big incomes. They're the ones that are going to benefit. And of course, if you have an even bigger gap, if you have a top rate of maybe 45% and then you have the pass-through rate of 25%, that is a huge discrepancy. You're going to have massive uh, pressure for people to recharacterize income that is now W-2 to make it pass-through. And so you're going to have to have a lot of rules to ring fence this. But of course, as I said earlier, 
you're going to open up all kinds of uh, loopholes and opportunities uh, that the tax accountants uh, can exploit. Now, I mentioned, too, uh, the real estate uh, deductions. And one of the largest, I think, I think the largest donors to Congress, and I think they give more to Republicans than Democrats, is the home builders. And the reason they want to continue to make these donations is they want to preserve these preferences in the code to make real estate a tax shelter because they're selling real estate. And if they can sell real estate combined with a tax shelter, they can sell the product for a higher price. So they want to maintain their ability to overprice their product, which is the irony of the whole thing that these tax breaks in real estate are making real estate more expensive, not not less expensive. Well, you have the same thing going on with accountants who give a lot of money to Republicans and Democrats to keep the tax code complicated because the more complicated the tax code is, the more people need to pay a professional to do their taxes for them, right? The last thing that the H&R blocks and all the big accounting firms and all the tax attorneys, the last thing they want is simplicity because the simpler things are, the more people can do the taxes by themselves and therefore the less the accountants can charge to do them for you. I mean, the taxes are now so complicated for me personally, based on the fact that I have a lot of overseas stuff going on. I mean, my old accountant couldn't even do the work anymore. I had to work with an accountant that is just a specializing in taxpayers that have income coming in from overseas because it's now so complicated and the penalties for getting it wrong are so enormous. I mean, 10 years, 20 years in jail that, I mean, it cost me a fortune. I mean, I actually have to spend more to file my tax returns than a lot of people earn working all year full time. I mean, it, it's amazing. I mean, at one point when I, early in my career, I mean, I'm paying now more in taxes uh, to do my to, to to have somebody calculate my returns than at one point I used to earn. Uh, so th this is really a nightmare. But of course, the accountants love it. I mean, these accountants are making a fortune. They're all lawyers, you know, because they understand all these complicated rules. And I don't even understand it myself. I still got to sign the forms. That I swear that everything is correct, even though I have no idea what I'm signing because the stuff is so complicated. I have to hire a professional lawyer that's even smarter than my CPA because my CPA can't understand it. And if a CPA can't understand my taxes, how am I supposed to understand them? Because I'm not even a CPA. So we'll see if we get a reaction, some type of sell-off in the markets, buy the rumor, sell the fact to the unveiling of the plan. Of course, we're still going to get the details of the brackets. It's hard to tell. Who, who has a tax hike or a tax increase unless we know where all these brackets begin and, and end. But also we'll see what happens with the dollar. The dollar has started to shed uh, some of its gains. I mean, it was down uh, today, a nice decline in the dollar. Not much of an uptick in the price of gold, although over the weekend, Bitcoin did make a new all-time high. I think it traded above uh, 6,300. Don't think that has anything to do uh, with what's going on in the U.S. economy. I think it's just, you know, more air going into uh, that particular bubble. You know, more news, more investors uh, uh, talking about Bitcoin and the potential of Bitcoin. So a lot of stuff going on there. But gold is still uh, not responding to the prospects of bigger deficits or potentially the prospects of a weaker dollar. But we'll see if we get some type of rea reaction to gold based on uh, the news of the details of the tax cuts based on the Fed statement that's coming out, based on who's going to be uh, reappointed as the Fed chairman. That could be a mover for the gold market, the, the, the jobs data. Remember, last month we got a negative print on non-farm payroll, 30, minus 30,000 or something like that, uh, related to the hurricanes. So we'll see. They're looking for a big jump now, catch up, I think over 300,000 jobs. So we'll see what we get there. But obviously the, the jobs number... Uh, can ha also have a weight on the dollar and on the price of gold. Let me change uh, gears and talk a little bit more about politics. You know, we had the first indictment today. This is this Mueller investigation into the Russia connection. I guess they're they're looking at the Trump Russia connection rather than the Clinton uh, Russia connection. But we had an indictment today. Uh, Paul Manafort, uh, one of Trump's former campaign managers, twelve counts. The guy's been indicted of money laundering, tax evasion. You know, he's being an, a, an unregistered foreign agent in the United States. All sorts of bad stuff. But all of it predates Trump. I mean, this was going on for years and years 
long before he was a campaign manager for Donald Trump. And so none of this has to do with any of Trump's uh, supposed connections uh, to Russia, but it all stems from these investigations. And maybe uh, Paul Manafort, you know, would have gotten away with all this had he not put himself underneath a magnifying glass uh, when it came to this investigation. So he ended up getting busted for something that's been going on for a long time. But apparently what this guy was doing was he was an agent of these Ukrainians and he didn't register the fact that he was a lobbyist for these guys. And he was being paid money into all sorts of offshore bank accounts. And of course, he wasn't declaring the income as taxable because he wasn't even supposed to have it because he wasn't registered as a lobbyist. And this is where, you know, had he come forward and reported his income, right, he would have incriminated himself, right? He would have now given the government this information. Hey, where'd you earn all this money? You just report all this money. And he, they, he couldn't say where he got all the money because then he would be admitting to a crime because he would, well, I got it from my client, but I didn't register myself as a, as a foreign agent. So he was damned if he did and damned if he doesn't. So, you know, once you decide to do one thing illegal, well, now you got to hide the money because otherwise you've, you've basically confessed, which is one of the reasons that, you know, filing a tax return is voluntary. But of course, it's not voluntary because my dad went to jail for not filing. But in theory, it's supposed to be voluntary because, you know, they can't force you to be a witness against yourself. The government can't force you to confess that you have illegal income, right? What one of the Supreme Court decisions was, was that, well, you know, you you don't have to write how you got the income. You could just write the income and, you know, take the fifth as to the source. But of course, the minute you do that, you know, you're a target. Now, wait a minute, you're, you're not going to tell us where you have all this money. They're just going to investigate you. So you put yourself into a position. It's like somehow if you steal money, the government expects you to report the money you stole on your tax return. And if not, now you're guilty of two crimes, theft and tax evasion, which I think is ridiculous. And first of all, it's ridiculous that the government wants their cut of the money that you steal, right? If you steal money, you're supposed to cut the government in. Well, doesn't that make the government an accessory after the fact to your crime? I mean, why should the government feel entitled to be cut in from drug dealing, smuggling, extortion, racketeering, right? That's how they got um, Al Capone, right? He was a bootlegger, but he didn't pay taxes on the bootlegging profits. But I mean, the government feels they're entitled to the illegal profits earned by a bootlegger. Wouldn't that make them part of his gang, right? So the whole thing is ridiculous. And of course, it's all unconstitutional because you cannot force criminals to turn themselves in. Or you can't even force honest people to give the government information that they, they can then turn around and use against you and potentially charge you with a crime, right? So, but I don't want to get into that for the purpose of this, of this podcast. But the point is, this guy was doing some pretty bad stuff long before he was associated with, with Donald Trump. The interesting thing is going to be, they've got a lot of stuff on this guy. I mean, this guy, to me, is facing a lot of jail time. I mean, there's some serious, serious, I don't know, 20, 30 years, 40 years. This guy could be in jail for the rest of his life as a result of what he's done. That means there's a lot of leverage that the FBI has over him to the extent that he has any information, which he probably doesn't. But if he has any information on Donald Trump, now, of course, Donald Trump can always pardon him. But then, of course, he would look particularly guilty if he went and pardoned this guy, right? That would create a firestorm in and of itself and maybe launch a whole new investigation into Trump and why is he pardoning uh, these guys and what is he afraid of? Because it seems to me that they're certainly guilty, although I don't want to jump to this conclusion, but it looks like yeah, they got a lot of evidence that suggests uh, that some serious crimes were going on uh, over an extended period of time uh, that substantially predates uh, his involvement with Donald Trump. But again, it shows you, you know, be careful what you wish for because this guy is the victim of his own success. I mean, he got this high... Uh, position job, you know, in the Trump campaign. And now look what happened, right? I mean, maybe this guy should have been a little bit more low key, knowing what he was involved with. He probably should have turned that down and tried to just stay out of the limelight, uh, considering, you know, the skeletons in, uh, in his closet. 